we're going to be talking about Chile's social uprising today and uh, COVID-19 and the constitutional reforms that uh, are being proposed and may or may not take place. This event is being recorded live. My name is Dr. Rodrigo Acuña. I'm coming to you from Sydney, Australia. It is uh, one o'clock here. Um, I've hosted several um, events throughout the years in academia and public uh, talks, but this is the first one I'm doing uh, live. So I do apologize if um, there are any blunders that, uh, that take place. Um, we're certainly trying our best here. Now, in terms of um, Alborada, I think it's important for you to know that Alborada has been around for 10 years and it was established by its editor, um, Pablo Navarrete, with its sub-editor, Nick McWilliam. Alborada has nine contributing editors. They are all experts in various areas of, of Latin America. They have um, expertise or they come from backgrounds in academia, journalism or human rights. And uh, they are certainly well qualified to be covering uh, the region. Just some housekeeping rules for your general information. So we are going to hear from our first uh, three speakers and they will be presenting for five to seven minutes. We will then um, be moving on to um, having some, some, I'll be making some comments and then we will have some uh, Q&A from the audience. We are being followed by uh, people in the United States, people in the UK, in Chile, in Australia and in Hong Kong. So to all of our, our viewers, uh, welcome. Now, once we open the forum up to um, the, the audience, you can send us your question via Zoom chat, or you can, and, and then you can choose to uh, ask your question uh, via video, or we can just, uh, I'll just read out your, your question. Now, obviously we have many people that are, that are tuning in, so we won't be able to take all of, your, all of your questions. We'll be able to take a few, but we will try and, and do our best to select the most interesting and uh, pertinent questions. Obviously, if um, your question is selected, please try and be concise so uh, we can then move back to our speakers so they can answer your questions. Finally, I need to mention to you Alborada's fundraising efforts. Obviously, independent media is in, it finds itself, uh, you know, all over the world in, in, in difficult times. Um, it's very different working for independent media as opposed to working for large conglomerate you know, organizations. And uh, independent media is certainly, uh, while at times, uh, and I think in our case, is, is, um, uh, has a, an, an excellent team of um, contributing editors, of, of, which one, of which I am one of them. Uh, we certainly uh, do need uh, your support. So if you visit our, our website, please donate generously. Now, the subject we're going to be covering tonight is the constitutional crisis and COVID-19 in Chile, the social protest. Now, currently Chile has 167,000, over 167,000 cases of, uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19. And as of Saturday, it has something like uh, over, over 3,000 deaths. The health minister, Jaime Mana Lynch, has resigned within the last 24 hours. There were numerous um, deaths which were suspected were not being reported. And that was actually the, the, the case. The, was the number of deaths were seriously being underreported and um, the minister has, has had to resign. The situation is quite critical. Chile is, if not, um, it's, it's certainly one of the highest um, countries in Latin America in terms of deaths. I think it's uh, second after Brazil. So the situation for a poor uh, you know, third world uh, country or developing country, it's absolutely uh, struggling. And the, some of the background information is that in October, 
massive protests began to take place. Uh, they were kicked off by the students who refused to, the high, high school students who refused to pay increasing fees on the metro in Santiago. And uh, these students were then joined by vast sectors of the Chilean population. These protests developed to such an extent, and they became so wide, that uh, the Piñera administration, the right-wing uh, government of Sebastián Piñera, decided to call the military onto the streets and serious repression began to take place against the protesters. I wrote an article about this late last year. Um, numerous human rights organizations have condemned the Chilean government for its human rights violations. Police, uh, military, specifically shooting, targeting protesters in the face with, uh, with pellet guns or rubber bullets. And hundreds of Chilean protesters have lost their uh, uh, eyesight, an, an eye, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, due to this harsh repression from uh, on the behalf of the uh, from the from the police uh, forces, military forces. Now, what are Chileans protesting? Why so much discontent that the protests stopped or came to a halt? Uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but the protests are really a combination of mass dissent against the free market economics which were imposed under the Pinochet military dictatorship. And once that dictatorship, which came to power, I should add, in 1973, with the support of the Nixon administration in the United States, that military regime left the constitution in the early 1980s, um, which was uh, uh, carried out through a referendum, quite a, a dubious referendum, um, but it basically tied Chile up to free market economics in the sense that large sections of the private sector are allowed to control the Chilean economy. So the state uh, has a minimum uh, in, in many areas uh, amount or a reduced amount of importance and responsibility to the citizens of the country. So that's what Chileans uh, are protesting. They're protesting the privatization of water. They're protesting the privatization uh, of a healthcare system or a healthcare system which is inadequate, the serious privatization of an education system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. It's one of the most privatized countries uh, in, in, in Latin America, if not the world and uh, Chilean citizens, uh, vast sectors of Chilean citizens have been quite upset uh, and, and, and protesting um, quite vigorously in the last few months. There is going to be a referendum that's going to be um, uh, taking place um, and our speakers will be, will be discussing that, but many analysts have said that uh, there are problems with how that uh, referendum uh, will pro will proceed, and how uh, the Chilean population is being consulted and, and included in that referendum. Now, before we move on to our speakers, I would like to share a short video on Chile and the most recent developments where working class towns are starting to once again engage in social protest. And uh, we can watch this video now, and after I will mention who produced the video, and we will move on to our speakers. So we will move on to that video. That video is available. Vecinos del Bosque, una de las comunas más pobres de Santiago, protestaron por la falta de ayuda del gobierno del derechista Sebastián Piñera en medio de la pandemia de COVID-19. Ayuda, alimento, porque eso no es por la cuarentena. La pandemia golpeó duramente a los chilenos, principalmente de pocos recursos. El problema, como les digo, no es la cuarentena, es la, es la ausencia de un Estado que no se preocupa por su pueblo.
esta América Latina convulsionada, nuestro país es un verdadero oasis con una democracia estable. Estamos en guerra. Contra un enemigo poderoso. de marzo del 2020. Y el ejercicio directo de la soberanía que nosotros radica desde este momento toma en sus manos este territorio. En nuestra lucha no nos detendremos hasta que estas mega empresas que amenazan y destruyen nuestra vida abandonen definitivamente nuestro territorio. Nuestro territorio. darle una oportunidad a la paz. Tuve que optar entre dos caminos muy difíciles. El camino de la fuerza a través de decretar un nuevo estado de emergencia. Nuestro escudo nacional dice por la razón, por la fuerza, por la fuerza, por la fuerza. Los partidos que suscriben este acuerdo vienen a garantizar su compromiso con el restablecimiento de la paz y el orden público en Chile. Habían 24 horas para cerrar un acuerdo, porque si no, el gobierno amenazaba con que los milicos iban a volver a la calle. Nosotros sí vamos a seguir consultando eh, por los detalles del acuerdo que creemos que no es tan claro. Esta amenaza del gobierno de tolerancia cero a las manifestaciones se ha cumplido ocupando caballos, ocupando carros lanzaguas, gases de forma realmente indiscriminada. Discriminada. que el coronavirus es un enemigo poderoso, 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 poderoso. Okay, so that um, video was uh, put together by Camilo uh, Sunes Perez, Marcela Villa, and Johnny Lopez uh, Cid. Um, before we move on, or I introduce our speakers, I'll just mention, um, or I'd like to re-emphasize how seriously human rights, uh, human rights violations that have been taking place in Chile have, have been, again, they have been recorded uh, by numerous um, domestic and international human rights organizations, including Amnesty International. And the executive secretary for the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean of the United Nations, um, Alicia Barcena Ibera, uh, recently declared that given the social conditions of Chile and given the way that the Piñera administration has handled the crisis, she expects that there could certainly be quite uh, uh, massive demonstrations once again taking place once this, uh, the, the quarantine for this pandemic is over. So having said that, I would like to introduce our first speaker who I believe is Hector Rios Jara. Hector Rios Jara is a PhD research student in social science at the University College London, uh, at the, at the, and, uh, the University of London. Uh, he's a member of the Social Theory Latin American Thought, uh, C, 
uh, Glasgow and the Chilean London Assembly, Asamblea Chilena in Londres. So Hector, um, if you would like to um, present your, your or conduct your, your presentation on the current crisis. I, I would like just to talk about the current situation in Chile. I think uh, uh, as the video show, Chile is facing a health and socioeconomic crisis where the structural inequalities and the lack of appropriate government responses helping to spread the virus. I mean, all the data suggests that the virus is out of control in the country. Uh, this situation is mainly the result of systematic mistake that the government has done to find a correct approach uh, to the pandemic. So I would like to explore two main aspects. Um, the first one is the inconsistent approach to social distancing, uh, distancing measures. Um, the, the virus was declared here as a global pandemic in January 2020 at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of this year. And most of the West countries adopted some measures since fe 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 February. Um, but in Chile, the measures were implemented just at the end of March, despite the fact that se several cases was uh, uh, detected and identified at the beginning of that month. Uh, later, the government refused to implement a general lockdown on major cities and prefer a um, very strange system called dynamic lockdowns. Uh, and that system was mainly orientated to protect the wealthiest district of, the, of, of Santiago and leave mainly unprotected the most populous and disadvantaged sector of, of the capital. Uh, during April and May, the government insists on the idea of, of having the virus under control. So it calls several times to return to economic activities, to rob in schools, to keep uh, shopping malls and, and other unnecessary services open. And finally, the lockdown in Santiago was declared just a couple of weeks ago, uh, despite the, the call of the scientific community, unions and organized society was claiming uh, at the beginning of March uh, and demanding for more uh, radical measure of social protection. So clearly social distancing me measures have been inconsistent, uh, are confusing. So the population, uh, I mean, the, the, the government tried to give a false sense of normality in order to protect the economy. The second aspect to consider here is the economic approach of the government. Uh, so at the moment, the government has implemented two emergency packages. The first one was in April, and that was orientated to recapitalize banks and gave some li liquidity in order to extend the credit lines for companies and consumers. Uh, that package also includes a unique bonus of around $63, uh, mainly orientated to low-income families. The second package was bigger, uh, this one was implemented at the end of April. Um, that includes uh, three months bonuses for around eight to three dollars. Um, but if we analyze both uh, measures, we, we need to consider that uh, the social spending uh, that the government is is introducing to confront the, the pandemics is 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 now beyond ten percent of the GDP. So, and this is, is one of the probably most modest uh, policies in the region in a context where most of the country uh, are investing around 15 or even 20% of the GDP confronting the virus. So um, it's critical as well the fact that uh, most of the sources came from relocation of, of, of the annual budget rather than a significant increase in social spending. So. This policy means an explicit um, measure of austerity, probably in the most uh, dangerous moment of the crisis. Um, why this is so important? Because um, austerity policies are in the opposite direction of, of, of social uh, pr 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 protection measures. So without economic support during the lockdown, people feel enforced to break uh, the lockdowns uh, to have some incomes 
we, we need to remember that families here uh, have been uh, su suffering a reduction of incomes around 40 and 60 percent. Uh, unemployment last month reached 50 percent. So this is so far the most radical and severe economic crisis in the country after the uh, 1982 crisis during the dictatorship. So in addition, the government has not implemented the necessary me measures to reduce or postpone uh, the debt of families, or at least to cover a proportion of everyday expenses like energy, water, uh, electricity. So the priorities of the government have been mainly on the protection of big companies, uh, financial industries, and uh, is supporting and an, an really absurd pretension of fiscal responsibility and a non-interventionist position uh, on markets, which is deeply ideological and is, a, and is in absolutely contrast with most of the policy and measures that even other right-wing governments have implemented around the world. So under this financial pressure and without economic support, most of the people is enforced to break the lockdowns and keep working. Uh, most of the people is developing informal economic activities to cope with debts, everyday expenses, and rising uh, of hunger. The combination of the health crisis and the socioeconomic crisis, of course, have radicalized uh, the structural inequalities that lead to the uprising of October last year. So in fact, uh, as, as we saw in the video, uh, during the last week, we have seen a return of street demonstration and barricades mainly on the periphery of Santiago, where the people is um, more exposed to the virus, has less support from health services, and is suffering the worst side of, of the economic crisis. So uh, facing the lack of response and the insensitive uh, of, of the government, people is, is organizing a grassroots system of solidarity and support. Uh, most of the assemblies, cabildos, and network that we saw uh, in October, last year now became popular food banks and um, we, we, we call Ollas Comunes and another kind of a initiative to give some support. Um, this popular reaction bring us some hope of course uh, they are operating as an alternative local measures organized by people against the uh, radicalization of inequalities. Uh, they are keeping alive the spirit of the revolt and collective solidarity um, however, we must consider that those organizations are precarious and they are very sensitive to the local context, so they cannot compensate uh, the policies of failure implemented by the government and, and the Minister of Health, Jaime Manjelic. So it's not a surprise uh, that the deep feelings of anger and justice and the set of being left behind that people expressed last year are just simply growing taking a more radical stance against the government, but also against the national elite, who are clearly responsible for the disaster and the death of thousands of people here in Chile. So the structural crisis of Chilean neoliberalism is not solved, uh, is neither postponed by the pandemic, actually I believe that it's taking a more radical character and a more dramatic tra trajectory. So hopefully, uh, this crisis will open some opportunities for transformation, but clearly uh, there is something that we still need to observe and analyze carefully. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation, Hector. Um, we are now moving on to Dr. Barbara Fernandez Meyella, uh, who is a Chilean academic currently working as assistant professor in Latin American studies at the University of Hong Kong. Her research focuses on a variety of topics that analyze Chilean literature, such as intersections between articulations of the, femin the female psyche and criticisms of neoliberal principles within the post-dictatorship uh, context. Um, I should add um, before um, Barbara presents that um, the um, Chilean uh, uh, police, the Carabineros, have been uh, accused of um, carrying out serious human rights violations against female demonstrators, which have included uh, stripping them uh, naked. Uh, there was a journalist who was um, 
uh, died under mysterious circumstances. And there are other cases of female activists being uh, persecuted in Chile. So I welcome uh, Barbara and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, and thank you, Hector, for your presentation. Um, well, good night, everyone from Hong Kong. It's almost 11.30 p.m. here. Um, well, I'd like to do a sort of a chronology of COVID and government mismanagement, offering very specific examples. So if I'm running out of time, Rodrigo, please let me know, because sometimes <laughs> I get a bit carried away. Well, okay. obviously, as an introductory statement, I, I, I would have to say that no country was ready for this crisis. Uh, but what we what we knew is that it moved from east to west. And Chile, because of its location, was one of the latest countries uh, to, to get the virus. And we had already witnessed what happened in Europe and in the worst cases that were developing in both uh, Italy and Spain. However, there wasn't a deep reflection on that and uh, the measures were not uh, enough and there wasn't an implementation of a lockdown as expected and um, which Hector uh, talked about in his presentation. So um, like in other countries that have failed to tackle the crisis, I would say that uh, there are two things that are relevant to mention that there is a denialism of scientific evidence which is reflected in the fight between the Ministry of Health and the working team there together with the medical association Colmed, which I think is ideological in nature because uh, the head of the Colmed uh, is a member of the Communist Party and the government is pretty much right wing. So they have denied uh, relevant information to the people that are actually seeing patients with COVID-19, that's important. And also this crisis has made it evident uh, that there are striking inequalities in Chile, which many of us already know, but, but now they're there to see. Uh, you see people going hungry, uh, people not having, um, well, pe Im immigrants going homeless, etc. So th these are things that we could talk about later on. So regarding the chronology, I, I, I have a few set dates that I'd like to mention, uh, to develop here. The first one is March the 20th, when the health minister Manjalic indicated that total lockdown in Santiago is absolutely insane. He said so in, with these words in Spanish. And he also indicated live on TV that he asked the following question. What, what if the virus mutates? We don't know anything about it. What if it mutates in a benign way and say becomes a good person? He actually said that. So, and that went viral internationally to the point that that's the sort of people that were in charge of the country by the time the, the crisis started. So it was a recipe for disaster from the first moment. On April the 20th, uh, I'm going to quote uh, a headline from a Hong Kong newspaper called the South China Morning Post, which said, coronavirus, Chile and China officials con contradict each other over donated ventilators. And this was a diplomatic impasse again. Uh, protagonized by Jaime Manjalic, in which he said that he was expecting China to donate between 500 to 1,000 ventilators to the Chilean state. Nevertheless, the Chinese ambassador said he had no information whatsoever on the matter. Um, that caused a bit of, a, of an issue there. Uh, the following day, there was a televised donation of protective gear from China, which included items such as masks, goggles, thermometers, and suits, but no ventilators at all. And Ambassador Xu Bu was uh, present there. Why is it important to mention China? It's because China has been having a worldwide campaign uh, to help and assist countries that have been affected by COVID-19. And also it's important to, to understand this help in the context of uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, which is uh, an infrastructure project uh, which uh, looks for global development, uh, economic development, and interregional connectivity, which goes all around the world, and, and Chile is subscribed to it. I'm not entirely sure uh, in, to which extent, but Chile is a member of this. So, so the relationship with China is important there. On April the 26th, the Minister of Health again and the Deputy Health Minister encouraged what they called a new normality. The new normality meant, and they said this on TV, and I remember this, they said, you can go out and have a coffee with friends or go out and have an empanada. 
And that was the, by the time that uh, the number of cases started to skyrocket. Uh, at the same time, they were unveiling a program in which they would issue certificates to those that recovered from the virus so they could return to work. And that was absolutely um, criticized by the World Health Organization because it wasn't really, really safe. By May the 14th, Las Condes district mayor and potential presidential candidate Joaquin Lavin attempted to open a shopping mall um, which ended up with long queues and more cases. Why is it important to mention Las Condes? Because it was one of the first districts in Santiago to have been in lockdown and also because it's an affluent area where people travel abroad and that's more or less the source of uh, coronavirus um, in Chile, people that were traveling to Asia or people who came back from, uh, from Italy. Um, Right, on May the 22nd, President Piñera started the campaign Food for Chile, which consisted in giving food parcels for the most vulnerable families in the country. I'm not going to go e uh, deeper into what means to be vulnerable in Chile because the criteria doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And a lot of people who are vulnerable are not getting the help and other people that are not vulnerable are getting the help. But the, the main point here is that there was a huge media campaign that was facilitated by all TV channels, which are close to the government. So the vulnerable families were acting on TV as if they were help, uh, thankful for the parcel received, which, which, um, which is difficult to, to interpret because the help is by no means charity. Uh, it's the state's responsibility towards its own people. Uh, by June the 8th, very recently, it was known that there was a set of instructions to make parcel deliveries sort of a campaign spot, indicating that there should be recordings of people doing the following. Number one, government officials giving parcels to poor families. Two, focusing on the family's thankfulness and emotion when receiving the help. And thirdly, acknowledging is, as President, uh, President Piñera's achievement. So this this looks like a campaign, a political campaign, and taking advantage of the pandemic for uh, political gain. By June the 10th, and I have only one more, uh, hundreds of Colombian citizens were camping outside their embassy asking to return home. They were both unemployed and homeless, and many families were waiting for uh, a response for repatriation. The Chilean government offered a humanitarian charter flight and asked immigrants to sign an agreement that indicated by that accepting that flight, they were forbidden from returning to Chile in nine years. However, that measure was deemed illegal by the court of Santiago uh, two days ago. And lastly, it was what uh, Hector mentioned that uh, the Minister of Health resigned or was removed. We have a new one now, but the main point is that he was uh, reporting the wrong numbers. According to journalist Alejandra Amat, currently and the government was reporting only 2,100. So you, you can see for yourselves that um, Minister Manjalic and his team are responsible for not only mismanagement of the crisis, but also for the deaths of uh, many people in Chile. So that's Sorry. Barbara, we just we just lost you a little bit there. Could you just repeat the the figure that uh, the Chilean journalist gave in contrast yes. to the Minister of Health, please? Okay, yes. So she says that actually there were five thousand deceased of COVID nineteen, and the government figures were around twenty one hundred. So this means that it's twice as much, or even more. Twice as much, correct? Yes, that, that was yes. my understanding that that they were fudging the figures between two yes. to three thousand. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, excellent, Barbara, uh, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. If we can move on now to Alejandro Kurt. He is a journalist with Hispan TV and Telesur and Telesur English. Telesur and Telesur English is a uh, joint uh, South American, Latin American funded uh, network. Um, and he was also a uh, he worked as a, a for, as a correspondent for the Rome-based IPS news agency for over twenty years, and was posted in several countries in South and Central America. Um, IPS news agency covers uh, news from the global South in an excellent manner, and I'm, I'm certainly quite uh, familiar with that uh, with that news agency, and I'm extremely happy 
to have uh, Alejandro Kirk. So, Alejandro, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I hope uh, everybody is listening well. Um, we can hear you fantastic. All right, thank you. Uh, we have been um, we have been on the ground since the very beginning of this um, uprising in October, and it's maybe interesting to 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 tell all of you what has been uh, this uh, issue, this the rebellion developing like since that uh, uh, epic uh, uh, date of October 18th. But this is, you know, this did not come out of the blue. Um, the popular uprising in Chile began in earnest in maybe 2006, when high school students rebelled against the, the educational system and were cheated by the government and the political parties of uh, when uh, Michelle Bachelet was in her first uh, term as president. Uh, then in 2009, there was a widespread um, um, chain of uh, demonstrations against uh, 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 huge dams that were planned to be uh, built in the Patagonia, uh, affecting uh, not only the, um, the, the region, but the entire country in order to provide electricity for uh, the mining uh, companies in the north of the country, which is a desert. And, they have been depleting all sources of water. And then in 2011, the, the most uh, known um, popular rebellion was uh, headed again by students, uh, this time university students demanding uh, free education and, um, uh, and the strengthening of the public education system in the country. And then again in, two, in 2017, huge demonstrations against the uh, private um, pension funds that were imposed by the dictatorship in 1981, which privatized the whole uh, pension system in the country, forcing people to uh, save 10% uh, of their earnings in order to fund uh, their own uh, retirement without any contribution from the government or the uh, uh, employers. And then uh, 2018 pro probably was the real beginning of this uprising when uh, um, by the, for the um, International Women's Day, uh, uh, th there was a, a huge demonstration in the whole of the country, especially in Santiago, uh, which uh, changed uh, pretty much radically the thought and the measures that were uh, being taken uh, in order to provide um, you know, the women right, women's rights movement that was uh, pretty much neglected. I mean, there was a, it all became, you know, it all came from um, accusation of sexual harassment in universities and, and it became a national movement and a very radical one in which um, a conscience of this situation was <clears throat> achieved countrywide. So that's how we arrived into this uh, rebellion in October 18th. Uh, at the same time, there was um, um, an economic situation that was uh, uh, worsening over uh, a couple of years, which also prompted uh, uh, this uh, uh, discontent in the country. So um, I'm already by four minutes, so I have to uh, be shorter. Uh, what we could see on the streets on, on, on that day of, of like October 18th was uh, chain of reactions. The students have been complaining about, uh, uh, like the video showed, uh, reducing the uh, protesting against a, a very small rise, rise in the uh, uh, metro fare. But this became uh, the catalyzer for the whole uh, grievances that were being accumulated, uh, maybe individually. So what we saw on the streets were these masses of people. All of them, all of whom, whom came to the uh, demonstrations on their own, without any leadership, without any political um, um, uh, organization behind everything. And you could see that everybody had, each of them, his personal, his or her personal agreements to expose in those uh, demonstrations. And beyond the repression, beyond the human rights violations of which 
we were witness, you know, eyewitness, witnesses and even victims ourselves <clears throat> uh, sprayed with uh, a pepper uh, um, gas. Uh, even our correspondent, Paola Dragnich was, uh, you know, he's a, a particular target of the police, uh, has been uh, uh, spied upon and sprayed herself with uh, pepper uh, gas. Well, we saw all that, but what beyond that there was joy. So in, in spite of all that suffering that we were witnessing every day, the uh, ocular uh, traumas, traumas that were causing people, these uh, people were happy to be again together. So there was a lot of chanting, a lot of dancing, a lot of happiness in those demonstrations. And there was this front line of people who were uh, pushing in self-defense the police back. So that, that's how we arrived in March into the uh, pandemic. And the pandemic came very handy for the government of Piñera because March was a uh, decisive month. The uh, International Women's Day gathered um, over a million women on the streets of Santiago. Men were not allowed. And mm -hmm. um, what uh, my, my, my friends have, uh, the, the other uh, panelists have exposed is uh, what happened from then on. So uh, I, I must, uh, just to close, uh, the, uh, Hector was saying the people have been organizing, what the organization that grew, very basic still, not, not really very well organized, but in the poor neighborhoods, which we call, you know, here, vulnerable, what vulnerable here in Chile means poor. Uh, what grew from there is what people are organizing now for feeding uh, the needed, uh, the needy, uh, for uh, getting food for uh, many people who can't afford it, those who are sick and have nowhere to go, and but it's still very uh, incipient. Incipient. It's not developed, and uh, that means. Um, and and, and the, the 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 motto here is that only the people save the people. But what has been described here by uh, Manjalich and and the government as policies that were mistaken, in my view, they are not mistaken. It is a policy to uh, prevent this world to start again. There is a battery of uh, repressive measures being adopted by the parliament uh, on the initiative of the government. Now there is a new intelligence law that will allow uh, the, the military to intervene in internal affairs once again. And so they are creating an atmosphere of fear. Scientists are uh, afraid of describing what uh, Alejandra Matus uh, uh, found out by just searching from New York, the civil registry, to find out how many people have died in previous years and how many people have died in the months of uh, March and April. And then, the, 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 so one single person, and then another uh, investigative outlet, uh, CIPER, uh, found out that the government was providing real figures to the Internet World uh, Health Organization and not to the people in Chile. And that makes the difference between 3,000 and 5,000 deaths uh, in the previous months. So um, uh, the mainstream media is not reporting on this. The mainstream media is reinforcing the uh, views of the government. And the views of the government are those of the main uh, economic powers in the country, the main conglomerates that uh, rule actually uh, the country who are afraid and who are uh, preventing a new revolt. And they have, so these loose organizations that are, were growing out of the uh, rebellion uh, are facing now a, a, a huge machinery that is led by the government, by the military, and the uh, economic powers in the country. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you, um, Alejandro. Thank you for that excellent um, presentation. Now, if I can um, um, make my, my questions and um, very, very brief uh, observations, I will return to Hector. And um, um, maybe you could uh, provide us with uh, some, some more information, Hector. But it was my understanding that when the Piñera administration called out uh, or declared martial law and, and called out the, the military, 
the the military was not only repressing traditional working class Chileans and work, you know Chileans from working class uh, towns, um, the the Chilean underclass, but also it was uh, operating in in sectors of the the middle class and uh, even even sort of the upper middle class. My understanding from how the debt system uh, works in Chile, for example, in terms of students who have the economic means to educate themselves through the private institutions, is that even though they have the means to do that, their, their debts uh, are quite extraordinary once they leave those institutions. So my perception from from my research and my visits to to Chile and how I try to follow developments as best I can is that the the Piñera administration really is almost um, acting on behalf of a, of a very small uh, elite in in Chile that's willing to almost uh, turn against uh, a center uh, right or a base that traditionally votes for the for, for, for the right. This is a very hard right in in Chile, which is which is currently in power. So, I'm just wondering, uh, Hector, if you would be able to to mention something on on uh, on those divisions within the country. Yeah, Hector, um, yep. yeah, I can hear you. Um, I think it will. Um, Social movement in Chile, as Alejandro was explaining, um, have been very popular uh, among different classes. So I think it's, it's hard to say that there is just kind of a um, middle income or low income sectors that are leading uh, the, the social movements in Chile. I think most of the social movements are very uh, general uh, around the country. So because I think social movements are fighting for, for right. So uh, middle classes and upper classes, most of them also are in favor of, of, of give some guarantees to social rights. Uh, and also I think they are in favor of, of a new constitution. I think uh, the, the government have been trying just to postpone and delay as much as they can the referendum because it's quite clear that most of the people are gonna agree uh, for, for a change in the constitution. So I think, in fact, the government is just defending a really uh, minor uh, and really elite group of, of the economy. Uh, well, actually, we need to remember that Sebastián Piñera is, 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 is one of the main um, fortresses in Chile and around the world. So uh, he's defending his own businesses. For example, we need to remember as well that the f former minister of health, Manjalic was also a director of, of one of the big uh, health private services in Chile. So there is a lot of networks of, of interest. Uh, most of them were created during the dictatorship uh, through the pri privatization of, 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 of public services and, and state-owned companies. So of course, the kind of government uh, now that is, is, is in power is mainly defending the interests of, of a, of a Minoritarian elite, but extremely powerful one. So I think the main problem is the measures to contain uh, the opposition is having, of course, fear, as Alejandro was explaining, but also a growing militarization of social security. We cannot forget that uh, um, the the government called for, for the military to the street uh, during October, but also did now. So we are in a state of emergency for 90 days. That was the first measure uh, taken by the government uh, at the beginning of March. Uh, and that probably was the first measure even before social distancing measures and economic plans. So we are under a heavy militarization of society. Uh, most of the sources uh, that now we can perfectly use to cope with, with, the, with the pandemic were spent at the end of the year and the beginning of the year in reinforce and uh, the police. So for example, if we walk around the street, you're gonna see that the main squares, uh, but most of the protests uh, were, were, being, uh, were organized uh, during the last month now is heavily guarded uh, uh, with, 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 with the police, special uh, forces. So any kind of protest 
that is happening right now in this roof of Santiago is being immediately uh, repressed heavily uh, with intelligence, but and also through the special forces. So, um, and the reason is because the government has no support on the population, even from the right side. So the base of, 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 of political support of the government is extremely narrow. Uh, and it's clearly that show that kind of concentration of economic power and political power within the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Excellent. I can... mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so the next question, my next question would be to, to Barbara. And um, I'm just wondering if you could clarify to the, the situation with uh, the government falsifying figures and how these um, how how this situation was was exposed, because when I was talking, when I was doing some of my own research, I was informed that the morgues in Santiago were were reporting, um, or were being told not to report on the number of, of of deaths, and there was also a situation in terms of the people that were coming into the morgues, the, there were uh, falsification, falsifications or misleading data regarding their, their actual deaths in their, uh, in, on their, their autopsy and their death certificates. So I'm just wondering if you could um, maybe provide us with a little bit more information into how uh, the government was actually exposed and, and how the minister actually had to resign. Well, I'm not entirely sure of the particulars here, I'm afraid. Um, but I do have to say this is not the first time that Minister Manjalic uh, lies and offers um, excuses for, he, for him not being like uh, a good minister. Um, we have to remember that in the first Piñera government, Manjalic had the task of, um, of reducing waiting times for people uh, having... Uh, um, having operations, etc., and, and what he did was to erase everyone waiting. So he deleted the list in a computer. So that's mm -hmm. how he got rid of them, which meant that a lot of people died. Um, so I think that the issue here is the calculations. Uh, we know that in the last few days, there's been a series of calculations and miscalculations that have been uh, reported by the government. So one day they say one number and they have uh, a given set of let's say factors that affect the number and then the next day they say no these are these other factors so i i, I think the situation is very confusing but the bottom line is that uh, they are refusing to give uh, actual information and um, and that also corresponds to sort of the behavior of the team when dealing with colmed because they they really need the information in order to um, in order to in order to act on behalf of the of the victims of the virus, I'm afraid I don't have much more information uh, on the matter. But it was yes, Alejandra Matus who who did this research thoroughly, and 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 she was the one that came up with the numbers, as you said before, comparing the figures of deceased uh, last year and this year, but also considering the amount of people that have been dying in the last few months of uh, influenza that it might have not been influenza, it could have been COVID-19. That's also something that has happened in other countries that they are going back in the figures that there was a surge of deaths with, in terms of respiratory illnesses and that may have be uh, because of COVID-19. Excellent, thank you. Um, Barbara, um, we should, I think, um, or you should um, confirm that uh, the the Chilean uh, journalist um, Alejandra Matos, you said, yes. Uh, yes, she was um, from memory. She's the author of the famous book on the Chilean judicial system during the dictatorship, and yes. she herself, um, in I think 1999, I was actually in the country at the time. Her book was about to uh, be released. It was a book on the corruption of the Chilean judicial system during the dictatorship and how many of these judges had continued to remain within the judicial system long after the dictatorship and uh, the book was actually uh, censored and there was an arrest warrant issued for this journalist and, and this took place um, several years after the, the dictatorship so she's certainly uh, a point of reference in, in, in Chile 
uh, in terms of uh, media work and exposing government lies. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much, uh, Barbara. My final question would, is to Alejandro, and um, I just I guess that I would like you just to clarify for our for our international audience how the AFPs in Chile work, how the the private pension system uh, works, because for many people um, internationally it has um, you know the privatization of social of um, of uh, superannuation and your and your your savings your lifetime savings um, is is just a, a matter of fact this system has been uh, privatized in many parts of the world but in the case of chile uh, again it's a, it's a more extreme case and there are many people who despite uh, signing up to these uh, private um, uh, organizations once they they retire they do everything by the book they find themselves with almost very little money almost no money and uh, they have to struggle well into into their retirement so I'm just wondering if you could mention a little bit about the AFPs and um, and how important they are in terms of protesters demands in terms of constitutional reforms uh, yes um... Just before that, I, I, I'd like to add something to what uh, Barbara said before about the Colombians. Sure. The, um, I, I, why I was, I visited these people who, who were um, taken into a um, uh, high school for uh, refuge because it was um, heavy rain here and, and, and it was getting very cold. So they were taken there and I, I, I visited them. I spoke to them and they told me that first, the, the, this flight, the charter flight is no more. So that has been canceled. And this flight was a charter flight which uh, was supposed to uh, go to Bogota and take people from Colombia to Chile. Chileans that uh, were stranded there or Colombians who are uh, Chilean residents, but they had to pay for this trip. And they are asking now these people who are homeless, who are on the streets, who have no job, and they have no, not even a visa, uh, to pay $500 to get into that flight. Uh, on the 17th of um, um, of this month, so uh, there's nothing like you know there's no free uh, lunch like they say, uh, and these people cannot afford uh, to pay for a room. Hardly they will be able to pay for uh, the, the flight, and then they have to also fund their own quarantine in Bogota, which is another four to five hundred dollars, just to uh, add to what Barbara uh, exposed. On the uh, IFPS, <clears throat> this is a private, uh, this is a genial scheme uh, devised by uh, Piñera's brother, Jose, who was minister, uh, who um, worked minister for the dictatorship for Pinochet. And this plan uh, forces people to, you know, they eliminated the state funded, the, the what, what what's called the um, uh, solidarian system that it is, uh, uh, um, in place in most countries of the, of the world, especially in Europe, where uh, you, uh, the worker, put some part of, uh, you know, of his salary into a fund that is complemented by the employer and then by the state to provide for a pension and so that who, people who are working now are paying for the pension of the elder uh, <clears throat> and it's called, you know, a generational solidarity. That was stopped and uh, they started a new system in which you pay 10% of your salary plus a commission of uh, now, has, now that it, because of the protests uh, has been reduced to uh, one about around 1%, but it used to be 4%. Uh, uh, a commission to these um, uh, pension funds which invest that money in international, uh, you know, they speculate basically in the, uh, in the stock markets in order to uh, get um to make that money uh, interest so that in the end it was calculated that it would grow by eight percent every year and after 30 or 40 years of uh of uh savings you would get a salary next to or very close to 100 percent of what you were earning while active that has not happened on the contrary people are getting uh um about one fifth of what uh, they saved. And um, this money is being introduced into the uh, economy. 
by these pension funds, which are private, and is used by the banks to lend money to people to uh, uh, make uh, ends meet at the end of the month. Mm. So people here, you know, that's it, what exploded with this pandemic is that you were forced to, uh, because your salary is not enough and you were middle class, you were forced to get into uh, debt in order to pay your bills. Uh, and um, at the same time, this uh, speculation, uh, because of the international uh, financial crisis now, is losing money in the stock markets. So people are, whatever it was, and it's, you know, it was re I was reading right before this uh, conference that um, about half of the people who have uh, um, gotten pensions by this system are getting less than the uh, uh, minimum wage, you know, which is well below the poverty line. So that's uh, what uh, is exploding right now. And uh, at the same time, we see that the military and the police uh, did not get into the system. They uh, remained in the old system and they're getting a salary in, on average uh, about 10 times more than uh, the average uh, pension in the private uh, sector. So, so to speak, the government is spending $2.8 billion a year in paying the pensions of military and police personnel, um, um, which are about um, 175,000. And it's, it's spending at the same time $2 billion for 1.6 million people, you know, in uh, complementing this uh, failed um, private pension scheme. So this is what is exploding here because many people who were middle class and got retired are now uh, searching for food on the streets, uh, being uh, expelled from their uh, homes. They cannot pay the taxes for their homes and they are being, you know, letting practically to die in poverty. People who were professionals, who were teachers, who were clerks, I mean, they were not uh, uh, indigents before this. So mm -hmm. that, that's what exploding. This is the social crisis of Chile. But that's the main, poli the main economic and political power in Chile now is the uh, AF AFPs. I mean, it's $200,000 billion that these people are holding and belong to the population. And they are not allowed even to get a portion of it to face this crisis. Mm -hmm. It's um. It's quite. Uh, thank you. Um, it's it's really quite uh, quite outlandish that um, you know these these uh, policies have been have been implemented. Uh, I remember seeing a report on a high school teacher who was into her seventies and the retirement pension that she was on from one of these private pension schemes did not allow her or did not provide her with enough funds to pay for her medication. So she was essentially. Um, begging for for charity on on the streets i think in a northern uh, town in, in in chile um and uh, you know for someone who's uh, uh, you know uh, an elderly woman who has worked all of her life as a high school teacher i think that's just absolutely disgusting um so yes i, I can um, many people that are f slightly familiarized with the private pension scheme in uh, in chile um would um I think many would, you know, would, would agree that um, that it is quite an unfair system. We're going to open up now the forum to the public, and the first question that we have coming in is from Kate Clark Will, and she will be asking the question herself via video link. Uh, like many people, I'm sure, especially those of us of my generation who lived in Chile at the time of. Uh, the popular unity government and Salvador Allende and saw that wonderful dream shattered in 1973. Uh, I have been really impressed and inspired by the protests, the massive protests in October last year. And I just wonder now if the panelists think that there's any role for the existing parties of the left, which were so important in the past, or whether it's more likely that some new party or movement will emerge. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, 
there's been a lot of change in in terms of uh, what some parties were in the past and what they are now um because of the current constitution there hasn't been enough changes uh, to the system including the pension system education system and healthcare to to improve the livelihoods of of chileans um, but at the same time uh, for example the government of ricardo lagos a socialist uh, was quite neoliberal and so were uh, the governments of bachelet so um, I, I don't have an answer to your question in, in terms of what I think uh, is going to happen, but the, the most relevant bits about the left or the institutional left is that the current protests do not have a political party. The current protests are about people who are fed up with what we inherited from the Pinochet regime and the lack of, of change. Um, obviously, there are reasons why things haven't changed uh, in the way that we would have expected, but um, social unrest, uh, I think, goes beyond a particular uh, political party. And I think the Concertacion had, uh, had many years to, to work towards doing something more. And, and, and I don't think, uh, I mean, they did things. They, they they improved the livelihoods of Chileans in comparison with the um, with the with the dictatorship, but I don't think it's 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 been enough. And some of the reforms to the pension system that make it as horrible as it is today uh, were voted during Concertación governments too. So I think it's important to to make that point. Um, the new parties uh, that emerged in the last few years are part of the opposition and are also negotiating with, uh, well, with the Piñera government in many unpopular, um, um, unpopular uh, things that he's done, like uh, curfew and so on. And also uh, about the referendum that I hope it takes place uh, in October. So that's what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you, Barbara. Um, we now have a, a question, and I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this person's name uh, correctly, Nay, Naya. Um, if I haven't, please correct me. Um, she's also going to ask the question herself via video link. Um, hi, uh, my name is Naya. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, Basically, what we wanted to know is with all that is happening now, with all this race in the COVID-19 cases and deaths, how any, well, if any of you want to answer these questions, how do you see that it will affect the referendum in October um, in terms of uh, campaigning and the lack of resources? Thanks. Yeah, about the, the, the referendum, uh, I was saying that um, this, the agreement of the referendum is very fragile uh, because this was uh, enforced by uh, social movements at the end of the year. So most of the uh, right-wing parties, including uh, people in the government, uh, disagree with the change of the constitution. So I think they're going to try to look for any kind of uh, trick to postpone, cancel, or delay the referendum as much as they can. And the problem that we're facing now is because the agreement was made between the, the political elite, uh, we don't have enough accountability over those agreements. So now it's just the left-wing parties without popular support, without pre representing uh, the movement uh, that create the concept for the referendum, who is trying to conduct, to lead those, those agreements. So we are returning, because the pandemic, we are returning to kind of close doors agreement between the elite and the establishment without any clear connection and representation from the side of social movement. So if we are not able to rebuild the momentum of protest, there is a, a big possibility that the referendum is going to be postponed again or going to be transformed unilaterally by the government or even with agreement with some of the political parties uh, at the moment. Um, maybe I would like to um, answer a little bit the last question. I think the key measures of the government is please stop to lying about the data. Uh, it's, 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 it's not possible that the government was hidden nearly 50% of the death of the country. 
There is no policy, there is no academic debate, there is no scientific advice that can work if the government is lying and modifying and intervening the data. Uh, the second is please stop to uh, stop austerity. Uh, the Chilean government have a lot of sources, as Alejandro was explaining before, uh, that we can use at the critical moment. So we can increase social spending to guarantee, for example, basic incomes uh, during the lockdown measure. We have enough sources to expand the public health system, but the government is trying to protect the savings. The government is, is, is absolutely difficult to understand why the government is protecting uh, fiscal stability in a context where around the world, most of the country are spending all what they have. So this is at least the two key uh, elements to face uh, immediately in, in the policy orientation of government. We have another question from uh, from from um, from Jennifer, and um, uh, her question. Um, I'll just have a look here. She says, "Hello, everyone. I would like to ask the speakers, based on your experience and the context in Chile, what recommendations would you give the government to implement now, considering the cost associated, not only." monetary so what advice would the the speakers have if you were to be uh, advising the current uh, Pineda ad administration um, uh, Barbara do you have uh, uh, an opinion there on 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 that matter so Alejandro do you have a, an opinion uh, well, uh, on, on advice, um, it, it's hard to say, you know, how to advise a government that is, like Barbara was saying, uh, quite ideological in its approach to this crisis. I mean, this is not, in my view, this is not a series of mistakes. It's a um, uh, uh, well-thought policy to um, promote fear, to promote uh, decimation of people so that uh, discipline will be imposed via uh, curfew, via the militarization of society and the fear of hunger, which is striking and people are not well organized. That takes us to, to Kate's uh, question. The political parties in Chile have a 2% uh, um, support from, according to the latest um, or the more reliable uh, polls. So with 2%, uh, uh, what you, would, you could see on the streets from October on was a, a, a plain rejection of political parties. In fact, no political party ever uh, could raise a flag there or a banner saying, you know, this is the party this or that. And where some of the people, including this Frente Amplio, the, 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 the new coalition of uh, younger, um, mainly students who uh, came to parliament and got 20 uh, parliamentarians, they also got into these negotiations with the government. And they were all spontaneously, spontaneously rejected by the people. So what's the role of political parties? I don't know. As for advice for the government, um, is the advice that anybody could uh, uh, give, you know, care for the people, give people the possibility to survive uh, in their homes with, uh, in, in quarantine uh, with dignity and not be forced to go to the streets to provide for, for the families. A new agreement was uh, reached by the political parties, the three of them, uh, former Concertacion, uh, what is the so-called uh, center-left coalition, uh, to provide for um, an increase of the emergency uh, income provided to families to from some $80 a month to 120 per person. That might, might in fact, uh, be a temporary solution if it is implemented. But the policies of the government are, you know, this, this country has a sovereign fund and this country has the possibility of getting uh, credit from international banks, but they are afraid of establishing things that will become a right and will not be possible for them to withdraw it later when the emergency passes. So they are trying to keep things under control. So my advice would be, be democratic. My advice would be uh, president, uh, establish um, uh, a committee in which all 
social organizations are consulted into what has to be done, especially the, the health workers, because only the, the doctors, only the physicians have been included in this social um, commission that is working along with the government, but not the workers who are, are actually facing the day-to-day the, the, the -day drama that we're living, that we're going through. So that would be my advice, be democratic, but being democratic means releasing the forces of people to be participant, to participate, to deliberate, to be influential. That's exactly what this government doesn't want to do. And that's um, and that's a a challenge historically for the uh, for the ultra right in in Chile. I mean, they have a, a very long record of detesting democracy, and uh, we could we could have a, another forum on 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 that issue. <laughs> Many historical examples. Um, we're going to go now to a question from uh, Dramond, and uh, he asks. Um, could the speakers provide us with more information on how Chile compares to the situation on the other side of the Andes, uh, where Argentina was fortunate to have ditched their own Piñera and elected a left government just before the virus uh, struck? Um, Argentina um, had uh, Macri uh, as a president, and uh, he went right back to the sort of free market economic policies that led to the crash in Argentina in 2000, uh, early 2000, uh, I think the, the date was 2002, 2003, roughly. Um, and, uh, and he went back straight back to those policies. And of course, it proved to be a total disaster for Argentina, currency devalued. And, um, and now Argentina has, has returned the, the center left. So do uh, any of our speakers want to, to provide with, um, uh, you know your your thoughts on on uh, on how the situation has been handled in Argentina or in other Latin, other, other Latin American countries. I participated in a webinar a few days ago, and one of the countries uh, that was represented was Argentina. Um, it's going to be a very brief comment, but from a comparative perspective, it seems that uh, the, the Argentinian model with the new president was more about consensus building and having participation and discussion rather than imposing force, which is the Piñera style, which is currently being known, uh, his style and Donald Trump style and Bolsonaro style, sort of, sort of called like um, authoritarian democracy, because these governments have been elected democratically, but they operate in a very authoritarian manner. Um, so according to my colleague from Argentina, this consensus building helped to create uh, an environment that was completely different. I'm not entirely sure of the particulars uh, because uh, in Chile you had people that were not respecting a uh, lockdown, uh, going to a supermarket while infected with COVID. I'm not sure how it was like that in, in uh, Argentina. I want to draw on the example of Hong Kong, uh, which is far away, but uh, it's a relevant one because the virus started here as well. It's, we're so close to China. And there's a bit more than a thousand cases and only four people deceased. Um, people in Hong Kong had the experience of SARS in 2003. But also there's been very serious measures. We've never been in lockdown. Mm -hmm. People themselves decided to lock themselves. Um, they were working from home. Uh, there is a lack of space in Hong Kong. So they, people live in very tiny apartments and they put up with it. Uh, they took it very, very seriously and wearing masks, for instance, was a priority when you had governments all over the West uh, saying, no, don't worry about the masks, they're not necessary, and they were absolutely necessary. A measure uh, that uh, Hong Kong took that I would like to share with you is that Hong Kong is going to give every inhabitant, permanent resident of Hong Kong, 10,000 Hong Kong dollars to cope with the crisis. That is equivalent to 1,000 pounds. We're talking about a very capitalist region of the world that is not used to doing these things. But the crisis is so big that they do have to hand cash to people, which is something that the Piñera government has failed to do properly. Um, it's true that there's been an agreement reached for, for more funds, but I think they'll be insufficient. It's good that, that these discussions are taking place, but I think they're too little too late. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, Hector, we, we will return to you, but um, I will um, have to ask you to be brief because we have 
we're going to try and squeeze one more question in and we, and we need to, to try and wrap things up. So do you want to make your contribution? Yep. Uh, uh, about Argentina, I think, uh, uh, of course, as I've ever explained, there's a different model of building politics, but essentially Argentina implement very early a uh, national lockdown with uh, a lot of support in, in economic policy that, that means uh, cash directly to families, but also a condonation uh, of, of, of debt. So uh, electricity and other everyday expenses were covered by government. Uh, even consider that the government wasn't in a current crisis uh, since last year and a huge external debt. So I think if government really wants to make a difference, the combination of economic policies to support and uh, a really a strict lockdowns were the key measure that actually most of the P uh, countries implemented. Uh, and that was absolutely uh, the wrong situation of, of the Chilean government that did not implement a lockdown. We are still just in a regional lockdown in two cities, not around the country, and we don't have enough economic support. Fantastic, thank you. We have um, a question here from Gabby, and she says, what was Chile like pre-1970? There is the narrative that Chile had a long history of democracy. However, colonization does not give for democracy as it is commonly spoken of. Certainly, Carlos Ibanez was not democratic, and there is no democracy while there were still indigenous massacres, for example, in Peru and Bolivia. The Pinochet dictatorship was not the only injustice. Chilean Black Book uh, Matus, she has written uh, there. So this idea that uh, Chilean, the long tradition of Chilean democracy was broken in 1973 with the US-backed military coup um, of uh, Augusto Pinochet. Um, many historians and, and many analysts would uh, point out that uh, there is a, a history of, of, of massacres against indigenous peoples and repression against uh, miners and, and, and workers and trade unionists and all sorts of um, sectors of, of Chilean society. Um, we maybe if um, um, Alejandro um, would like to, to make a comment or, or Barbara, um, um, or of course Hector as well on, on on Chilean history. I, I just want to I, recommend a book, <laughs> that's all. Uh, it's by Patricio Mans, uh, the folklorist. Uh, it's called Chile, una dictadura militar permanente, uh, which talks about this. I mean, there's a tradition of uh, crimes against humanity and, uh, and how the Chilean police uh, uh, started and why it shouldn't surprise us that they act the way they act. Um, so that, that is a particularly good book to, to talk about this. Um, I'm not a historian, so I wouldn't dare to, to say much more, but uh, that's a really good book to, to find the information. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> Rodrigo, the, um, the um, ahead, I think uh, the democratic forces fighting against the dictatorship uh, helped in creating this uh, myth of uh, sustained, um, sustained Chilean democracy for 200 years, which is not the case, no way. Uh, there was a formal democracy in which there was a parliament, there were elections, uh, people were able to vote, uh, but and in conditions that only in 1949, for example, women were allowed to, to vote. And um, uh, it's well known the Chilean Air Force, uh, the only uh, battle that they have fought in their entire history of 100 years, is bombing the presidential palace trying to keep President Allende. And the, the army has uh, staged uh, coups or semi-coups uh, many times, uh, pressing for uh, their own interests. And um, in a civil war in, 19, in 1890, when a nationalist president um, tried to um, impose nationalistic policies over the uh, mineral resources of the northern side of the country just taken, by the way, over from Peru and Bolivia. Um, uh, the, this army uh, uh, performed many more massacres. About 10,000 people were dead in that civil war, of which we learned very little uh, at school. And then there were massacres all over the 20th centuries against, uh, century against workers, 
and particularly, it's uh, imp uh, very important to say, in the 19th century, there was this called pa Pacificación de la Araucanía, where the army took over of uh, sovereign territory, breaking all treaties that there were between the Mapuche people and the crown of Spain first, and the Chilean government later, uh, Chile broke, uh, broke, violated those treaties and invaded the Mapuche land, um, establishing, giving that land to uh, big land owners and to foreigners that they were going to uh, pick from, from Europe. Many Germans were brought to take over uh, Mapuche land. So the army and the police uh, are not, they have never been other but um, force of repression for the same powers that are at, um, in, in place now. I mean, the social situation has not changed except for the three years of Salvador Allende. And before that, because of a massive uh, class struggle, uh, changes made by the previous government of President Eduardo Frey, a Christian Democrat, Democrat who was trying to impose um, a revolution in freedom, the way the, 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 it was exposed in order to stop what came over later, which was the Unidad Popular. Correct, correct. Um, I, I would add that many of, um, or several of Allende's uh, reforms would have not been possible had uh, Frey not been in power and sort of uh, opened, opened that path. And of course, the history of the Christian Democratic Party in Chile, like in many uh, parts of the world, was uh, a force that was supported by conservatives in order to stop uh, more radical forces coming coming to power. Um, we have now, unfortunately, reached the the end of our uh, conference, our, our on live uh, Zoom conference for uh, by Alborada Latin America Uncovered. I would like to thank Hector Rios Jara, Dr. Barbara Fernandez Meireya, and Alejandro Kirk. Um, our speakers were um, had made excellent presentations and uh, provided us with much needed information. Two more points before I sign off. The first one is for all of our listeners to please log into, uh, log onto our, our website, have a look on, on our website. The content is uh, free. Um, there's a lot of interesting content that is constantly being uploaded and that includes um, sh short videos, um, interviews, articles, analysis, et cetera, et cetera. There is a wealth of information on Latin America um, by a, a highly qualified team of contributors on Alborada. So please uh, donate uh, and support independent journalism generously. Once again, I would like to, to thank all of our uh, speakers. I would like to thank uh, the technical team uh, behind um, the um you know behind uh, sort of closed doors that have been helping me and um i would like to thank the editors at uh, alborada for putting together such a fantastic uh, event thank you very much my name is dr rodrigo acuña and i hope you have enjoyed this conference